Hello everyone, welcome to episode 2 of the Bible in a Lifetime podcast. We're currently going through the Gospel according to John, diving deeper verse by verse using multiple translations to glean some insights. If you like this podcast, please consider becoming a patron over on patreon.com slash fullofgracetv to support future episodes. And with that, let's start where we left off. John chapter 1 verse 15 in the NRSV. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. Other translations use the word witness here for testified. We have John's witness to him in the Knox translation and John witnesses to him in the New Jerusalem Bible. The Greek word being translated here is martiri, where we get the word martyr from. It's about sharing one's experience, testifying to what one has witnessed, seeing the salvific work of God in the person of Jesus Christ and proclaiming it to the ends of the earth. This thread runs through the entire Gospel of John, of witnessing and testifying. From the very beginning of the Gospel narrative, we are already at the trial of Jesus. We'll later hear about how even the Father and the Spirit testify on Jesus' behalf, just as Jesus testifies through his life and by his death on the cross, becoming the ultimate martyr, proclaiming what Christian martyrs after him proclaimed, that God loves you, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who conquered death, freeing us to hope for a new creation, a humanity glorified and restored to our original dignity, where we reign with God as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that we may announce the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. The second part of this verse reminds us of what we heard earlier about the pre-existence of Christ. John the Baptist says that Jesus was before him, or as the neighbor puts it, he existed before me. What's interesting about John the Baptist saying this is that John was older than Jesus, as we know from the Gospel according to Luke, John's mother Elizabeth was already six months pregnant by the time the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to announce the incarnation of Jesus. But not only was John older, but by the time Jesus' ministry began, John had already become a renowned teacher and prophet among the people. And here he is proclaiming how great this new younger guy Jesus is, again signaling to his followers and all of the people that if you like John the Baptist, you're gonna love Jesus. Let's continue. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace upon grace points to the fact that we have received an accumulation of grace. Grace stacked upon grace. The New Living Translation puts it thus, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. This speaks to the overflowing blessings God has given to his people. Not content with simply giving Israel a covenant, he extends his new covenant to the whole world. Not content with temporal sacrifices which the people of Israel often botched, God provided the one eternal sacrifice of Jesus Christ which we participate in at in every Mass. Not content with the Spirit residing in the temple at Jerusalem, He now makes each one of us a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Knox translation puts it this way, We have all received something out of His abundance, grace answering to grace. Jesus Christ is the culmination of this story of our salvation. He is the answer to all the prayers of the people and prophets of the past. The new covenant answers the call of the old. Jesus, the new Moses, answers the hope of the old Moses that Israel would listen and love God. Jesus humbled himself in obedience to God the Father, even to the point of dying as a criminal on a cross for the love of God and his people. Jesus answers the promise in Genesis of a descendant of the woman who would crush the serpent's head, a descendant of Abraham who would rescue the world. God the Son 
answers God the Father with these words, Not my will, but yours be done. And now the Holy Spirit within us answers to the Father and the Son through our lives and our commitment to the Christian life, Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. The neighbor renders it this way, We have all received grace in place of grace which points to the replacement of the Old Covenant with the New. As the following verse implies, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Moses was a type of Christ, foreshadowing the coming of Jesus. Just as Moses led the Israelites out of bondage, Jesus Christ now comes to lead the entire world out of the bondage of sin and death. The law pointed the Israelites to the holiness of God, and it called Israel to become holy. This call to holiness extends to us now, but it is made easier because of Jesus Christ, who fulfills the law through his perfect love of the Father, and sends down the Holy Spirit upon us to help us. So now each one of us is called to be a saint by loving God and each other. In this way, we fulfill the law and spread the holiness of God to all creation. Even the mundane tasks of daily life become holy if we do them with great love. This was the simple secret of St. Therese of Lisieux, becoming a saint by doing ordinary things with extraordinary love. Let's continue with verse 18. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. God is pure spirit, invisible to our natural human eyes, but because of the Incarnation, in the face of Christ, we can see the face of God, the visible image of the invisible God. Later we'll hear about how the Apostle Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father. And Jesus, surely with a tinge of sadness about the spiritual obliviousness of his disciples, responds, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God to humanity. In Jesus, we can see, hear, and touch God directly. Jesus is also the ultimate revelation of humanity to God. In Jesus, we see the royal humanity that we were called to be in the Garden of Eden, living closely united to God. This great mystery of the Incarnation urges us to reject the extremes of false religions which say that, Only the spiritual is good, or only the material is good. God, from the beginning, intended to live united with his creation. Both the spiritual and the material is good. God called creation good and from the moment of the Incarnation has begun to restore all things in Christ. Let's continue with verse 19. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. During this time in the Second Temple period, the people were living in great expectation of the coming of the Messiah, to save them from the Romans and take the throne of David, restoring Israel to the once great kingdom who could defeat the nations around them. John's renown as a great teacher and prophet had the people talking. He had a large following, and it made people wonder if he was the Messiah. But he denied that he was the Messiah. John would not save them. Then they asked him if he was Elijah. It was said that before the coming of the Messiah, Elijah would literally come again. 
Even now there is a Jewish Passover tradition to set an extra cup of wine on the table and open the door to welcome the prophet Elijah, hoping he will enter to announce the coming of the Messiah. John denied he was literally Elijah. But as we hear in the other Gospels, he does fulfill the role of Elijah in announcing the coming of the Messiah. Then they ask John if he was the prophet. Again, he answers no. This prophet was different than the prophet Elijah. They were thinking of the new prophet like Moses that was promised in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, where Moses says, A prophet like me will the Lord your God raise up for you from among your own kindred. That is the one to whom you shall listen. This role was not fulfilled by John, but by Jesus. Moses was not just a prophet who spoke for God, but a mediator who interceded for the people of Israel, asking God to forgive their sins, even offering his life for them. This Jesus would do for the entire world. Finally, Seemingly frustrated at John saying no to all the possibilities, they ask him, Okay, fine. Who are you? What do you say about yourself? We need an answer. It's funny, isn't it, how often we act like this. We bring so many prejudices to our interactions with people. We prejudge not only people but situations, thinking we've got it all figured out from the judgments we make. But do we stop and listen to people? and their own experiences about themselves and their situation. A lesson for all of us. Let us ask others who they are and what their experience is. Sometimes we won't understand everyone all of the time, but it begins by listening, letting them testify to the truth of their experience. So what does John finally say about himself? He uses words familiar to everyone listening the words of the prophet Isaiah, words which provided a powerful testimony, signaling to all who heard it that they were right in one thing, their expectation that the promised salvation was near. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Let's continue with verse 24. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? Here I prefer the grammatical construction of the New American Bible because it makes it clearer. It says, Some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? This was a different group from the priests and Levites who asked the previous questions as they would have been Sadducees, not Pharisees. So the Pharisees ask John why he baptizes. Let's continue with his response. John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Here John declares to them that his baptism is simply a baptism with water, a symbolic purification and preparation for the greater sacrament of baptism, which, as the Catechism says, seals the Christian with the indelible spiritual mark of his belonging to Christ. So much greater is this sacramental baptism and all the graces that Jesus will usher in that John declares his unworthiness comparatively. The New Living Translation puts it thus, John told them, I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. Just imagine how shocking that must have been to those who heard him. This great teacher and prophet of God, who was so popular among the people who garnered great crowds and the attention of the religious leaders, He was declaring that he wasn't even worthy to be the slave of the one who was coming after him. After testifying about himself, John testifies of Jesus in verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, 
Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself do not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. Again we have this theme of seeing and proclaiming, witnessing and testifying. In addition to the previous statements about Christ, here we hear for the first time that he is the Lamb of God. This title alludes to the Passover Lamb, symbolizing the deliverance from slavery in Egypt and also of the suffering servant figure in Isaiah who is described as an innocent victim being led like a lamb to the slaughter, to atone for the sins of humanity and reconcile us to God. Like the Israelites who ate the Passover lamb to celebrate their deliverance from slavery, we in the New Covenant eat the new Passover lamb in the Eucharistic liturgy to celebrate our deliverance. Let us remember this every time the priest lifts up the host and says, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Let us indeed behold, and having witnessed, let us testify to the great things God has done for us. Quit all these peccans.